Hey, thanks for joining me for another Origins of Christian Rock. And uh, sorry about taking a couple weeks off there. And uh, but boy, boy, we're back, and we have Roger Dale Martin with us from Vengeance. And uh, those of you that have been following Sanctuary from the beginning, this is a name that's synonymous with the start of Sanctuary, uh, and no doubt the band as well. So let me get Roger Dale uh, on the screen here, and we'll chat for a little while. Hello, Roger. How are you doing? I'm doing just fine. How's everybody out there? <laughs> They're doing good. Um, but this, this has been a fun series. I mean, a lot of people don't understand um, uh, the history of Sanctuary. And so, um, you know, we've had different guests on, which they've all been amazing. But there's a few of you that have been with Sanctuary from the start and uh, or know the early days. And so um, I, I, thanks for taking the time to be with us. And um, you know, Vengeance, that's one of those groups that, um, boy, it, it, they're iconic. You, you, your group was iconic. And I've been to Pastor Bob's house many times, and he still has the record label on his shelf. And he's always reminding us, see that hand on that record cover? That's mine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, tell us a little bit about uh, yourself, a little bit about Vengeance. Um, you know, more so like the early days, because I know that this was like a sanctuary pastor, Bob, and you guys getting together saying, let's fill this in. But why vengeance? What, you know, and, and where were you guys wanting to fit in and fill in a void that you guys saw coming up in, in culture? Well, <clears throat> sanctuary uh, began, I mean, I was there maybe not the first two weeks. Uh, I, I might have joined like the last two weeks, uh, of, of like two weeks or started. But anyway, supposedly I wasn't there. Uh, I never went to the Stopper Bible studies, but I think it grew. That, that's what uh, Pastor Bob said. It just grew and grew. And, and <clears throat> there was like three or four different locations, basically. And, and I oh. were all four of these locations. And we were really, uh, we were really, I don't know about these other guys, but see, it was a perfect time in history because there was, for, for me, I grew up in the church. Um, I was born in 1958. Uh, I grew up in a church uh, and the summer of love, 67, I was, I was about 11 years old and, and okay. stuff like that. But I grew up in concert time uh, and, now, and, and my celebration was at concerts. Uh, it's, and, and we that that's that's how I wanted to celebrate, and though that that's that's my generation. I say uh, early seventies. Um, I graduated in nineteen seventy six from high school. I, I think there was a whole lot of us that that needed um, express ourselves in a different manner than a traditional church. Okay. And, I, and and of course with sanctuary, I was able to do all those things. It was perfect timing, uh, uh, and for what we need to do, I think God was moving. Uh, there's now, a certain group just, of people. Uh, just, just really quick, take us back. You said in the in 76 is when you graduated high school. Um, and so you were well in tune with the music and everything. It, do you remember on the Christian scene what the Christian rock era was like at that time? That I mean, in, in 1976? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I bought an album around that time uh, because I saw it in, in a store. Uh, just you know one of these used record stores that uh, just record store and it was long-haired guy and his name was larry norman that was the first time i knew anything it was called in another land okay and, and that was the name of the album that's the first time i've ever seen anything christian rock and this was about 1976 is when i got the album yeah now <clears throat> i think there was some early jesus freak stuff going on in the early 70s but i really wasn't a part of that uh, uh I, I started i just that one album by Larry Norman was the only thing I ever saw uh, by any kind of Christian uh, rock and roll, anything like that, until I went to California in 1984. So, so I had 76, uh, I had about eight years uh, of um, <clears throat> growing up, you might say. Yep. Uh, so in 1984, how old was I? Uh, um, 26 years old. I was 26. So I had enough years under my belt where I wasn't a kid anymore. Uh, I, I traveled uh, different states working. And so when I hit California, <clears throat> I was mature enough to do some things. Uh, I, actually, I was one of the elders in the church, which <laughs> at 26 <laughs> years old, you know, <laughs> that, I was one awesome. of the elders. <clears throat> 
but God moved me out there. As far as me personally, uh, everything led up to 1984 for me. Uh, the frustrations, uh, uh, playing in a band, uh, and and just my per me personally, almost it was perfect timing for Roger Dale Martin to be in Los Angeles, California, Halloween night, 1984. Okay. Uh, things just blew up for me, uh, and and. It happened on the way out there is when really I, I, I really started uh, developing a closer relationship to God because I, I was in a, I was in a pickup truck that wasn't running very well and back in those back in those times uh, from Oklahoma to Los Angeles there is a period of this thing called a desert Bob <laughs> I mean we're talking you're out in the middle of the desert. There are no cell phones. There are nothing. There's a hundred miles, nothing behind me, a hundred miles, nothing in front of me. And it was just myself. And I had a little, I, I was married at the time to a little big girl and I had everything in the back of the truck. Huh. I had in that. And, and yeah, basically I, I was, in, I was in, uh, I was in dire straits because my truck would, I couldn't, my, my pickup would not go over 55 miles an hour. And, and so I don't know if I, what I was going to do. And so I, I really started my relationship with God again <laughs> at that point uh, by praying, Lord, help me to get there. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm, I'm talking about sincere prayer uh, to the max. And once I got there, I, I got hooked up with a band called Emeralds uh, and they were a Christian band. The first I've ever, other than Larry Norman, uh, was the first I ever heard about Christianity in, in a rock and roll context, and this was metal. Actually, this was glam metal. Those guys were glam rockers. Um, well, which, which was totally bizarre for me, but uh, I was into it. Uh, once I got in, once once I moved into Los Angeles, uh, I got hooked up with these guys, and and the lead lead singer said, "Roger, you need to go over here to Harvest Christian Fellowship," and, and he was all. He was all about, you know, are you a Christian? Do you have bad habits and all that? Um, and I went to Harvest Christian Fellowship, and there was a band there, a rock and roll band, a blues band called the Daryl Mansfield Band. Oh, it's and a he, good band. He was preaching. It's a, once again, this is the, now this is the third band I've ever heard that was a Christian band, and it was okay. Daryl Mansfield. Uh, they were at Harvest Christian Fellowship, and, and he gives the altar call, and he says, I don't care. Uh, he was like, if you want to rededicate your life, because uh, I was saved. Believe me, I, I knew the Lord. But when it came time to dedication, I ran down the aisle. Okay, and here I am. That's when things really started for me spiritually. And then I, I started I started kind of feeling my calling, you might mm -hmm. say. Yeah, this is, and I'm very excited at this point. And then I did my time with Emeralds. While I was in Emeralds, um, there, there was a, uh, Somebody told me about this Bible study. I said, there's going to be some guy there. Well, there's just a Bible study, a really good Bible study. So I said, okay. And I took off this morning. We didn't have rehearsal that night. So I took off and went to this Bible study. And it was in a different little town. I can't remember the name of it. But once I walked in, there was a dude uh, uh, with a big media screen behind him. And, and he said, take heed, take heed. Here's rock and roll. I'm, I'm exposing the devil. And it's all those lies and the devil and how he plays tricks with everybody through rock and roll, ACDC, uh, all these bands at the time. Uh, it was exposing the evil of rock okay. and roll. Uh, and I thought the guy that was doing the doing the talk was fantastic. He was absolutely, he had everybody about him, Mesmerized, complete control. And uh, after it was over, I went up and talked to him. I said, hey, I'm Roger Del Martin. He says, yeah, our names are similar. I said, my name's Roger Martinez. And huh. this was way before I knew anything about sanctuary. And, and so he started talking to me about a thrash band. I said, Roger, I'm, I'm going to put together a thrash band. And, and I, I am wondering if you're interested. And I was not interested, Bob. I, I said, uh, no, uh, glam metal was king in Los Angeles at the time. And we're talking about 1984. Oh, yeah. And, That's the heart of yeah, it. Yeah. And uh, made that, when I met him, it might be in 1985, but still glam rock was king. You had Poison, you had a lot of these Guns N' Roses, and all these guys were really glam. And I, I was not interested. Uh, I said, no, uh, I, I, I'm on a roll here. I don't want to change my genres, you might say. Yeah. <clears throat> and then after that, uh, Emeralds was looking for a, a, a vocalist. And they, they always had a hard time keeping a vocalist. And somebody told me, hey, there's the Bible study. Um, down in uh, Whittier, or kind of a church or something. Uh, go down there, there, and they're supposed to. And actually, it was Janice Sweet. 
who, who got a hold of somebody and they told me about it. I said, okay, I'll go check it out. And I went down there to check out the Bible study that was in a church. I think it was in a Catholic church somewhere around three in the afternoon. Okay. And then uh, I walked up to the door and there's a great big guy at the, at the door with a huge afro and this grin that was this massive. He said, hi, I'm Pastor Bob. And I said, <laughs> hi, I'm Roger Dell. And that is when I met Pastor Bob. There, there might have been mm, 15 people in the church. Okay. And, and a bunch of long hairs. And, and uh, I, I was like, wow, this is pretty fantastic. And I kept going. Uh, and eventually, my time with Emerald was over. And uh, I started playing on the worship team. And during this whole time, Bob, I saw the congregation get bigger and bigger and bigger. It never went backwards. It always went forward with the attendance. And um, we started getting bands, uh, actually full bands show up. Okay. I was like, wow, there's a new band. That's it. What, who is that? What are they called? They said, Those guys are called Holy Soldier. I said, Holy Soldier. Yeah. And then I would see the band. Well, the very next week, all of a sudden, it wasn't just Holy Soldier. It was Holy Soldier and their fans. Maybe maybe a seven or eight different fans. And, and that's how really Sanctuary started getting bigger and bigger. It was bands showed up. And okay. then their fans. So it wasn't just, uh, it was the metal community and, and uh, the musicians were just drawn there. The musicians were drawn there because of the music. We had, we had, uh, we had, Bob separated the music. Uh, we had what we had worship, which is really calm and and uh, kind of relaxed. And they had celebration, which and celebration was all out uh, like a concert. And, and we did that first uh, to get our yaw yaws out. Okay, we were young, mm -hmm. we were fired up. Okay, and this crazy was very necessary. Oh yes, it was necessary. And and then then after we had our celebration time, we were able to relax a little bit and get a little bit more spiritual time. Okay. Let's, let's, let's mellow out and, and, um, and have that type of worship. And, and that's how we started. I, and we started, I was on the, I was on the sanctuary. Uh, I played with a band called Holy Rot for a little while and I was still in glam mode. And, and um, and then that, uh, they were in Riverside and all, and I moved all the way down to the South Bay. At this time, uh, I moved right down in, in the middle of everything. Uh, I believe Sanctuary could have been in Man Manhattan, Redondo Beach. And so I moved to Redondo Beach where everything was happening. Emerald was way too far away. So was Holy Rock. And so as a musical outlet, uh, I started playing on the Sanctuary worship team. Uh -huh. and, oh, lots of guys, everybody rotated on the Sanctuary worship team. And there were so many bands. Uh, it was fact, I, I, I might have been one of the regulars on bass, uh, but even that, that uh, position would rotate. <clears throat> but what was, was happening? Was that at the time that, uh, cause I know, uh, was it, were you in like, um, who, uh, Jim Laverty, was he on there at that time as well? Yes, he was. Jim Laverty, uh, he was on the scene in the very beginning. Okay. In fact, uh, that was another band. The, the fourth band that I found out was Baron Cross. Ah. Now Baron Cross was one of the original metal bands. No joke. Uh, if, if there was a, an original I would have to say Baron Cross was there. Uh, and Jim Laverty was a big part of Baron Cross. Him and Bob were big buddies, and they, they, they're always big buddies. Yeah. So I remember Jim. He, he was he was there in the very beginning. Okay. Uh, uh, and I remember Baron Cross. I remember their ministry. I remember uh, going to a few of their shows and stuff like that. But they were pioneers also. Uh, uh, they they kind of had the uh, Iron Maiden. Uh, Mike Lee, he, he had that Bruce Dickinson voice. Uh, yeah. which is it's hard to reproduce uh, and he, very talented band great band um and so he, he was a big part of that i was a part of the worship team and then some things changed okay los angeles was heavy metal all the way los angeles county had a neighbor it was called orange county orange county was the capital of punk rock music uh -huh. Without a okay. shadow of a doubt, uh, Orange County was punk to the max. Okay. Uh, and, and for all the newbies out there, punk rock and heavy metal are way two different things. Oh, yeah, they were different. <laughs> uh, but sooner or later, uh, punk metal came together and they called it speed metal. That's the, that's the first term I ever heard, speed metal, because a lot of that punk stuff was fast. 
Yeah. Um, uh, and so uh, eventually, and that's what happened, uh, speed metal or thrash, however you want to call it, um, that began. There, there were no Saints of Revenge doing anything like that. Everybody was still in, in glam mode. Uh, uh, lots of colors. Uh, it was still, that was still King. Yeah. But somehow, Pastor Bob started, uh, somebody went, they came to Sanctuary and they were really into that speed metal, uh, 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 black metal, that, that thrash scene. And Bob realized that we don't have a single band that's, that's, that's in that area. Because our whole point was infiltrate the metal scene and present the gospel. Yeah. That, Believe me, that's why we succeeded, because that was our goal, was to infiltrate with the gospel, because their hearts were ready. Uh, back then, uh, 84, if you were into metal, there was a whole lot of, I could say, religious aspects of metal. Mm -hmm. uh, imagery, uh, when I say religious, not necessarily Christian, but, but um, spiritual. And so I think a lot of people at that time were open to everything spiritual, uh, good, bad, ugly. Cause there was a lot of satanic bands at the time, and so so they were they were into maybe a dark spirituality, uh, or, or, or however that was. The whole thing about vengeance was Pastor Bob asked me and asked Doug thing because we were both on the worship team. Look, you guys, and and they he knew that we were musicians that we weren't we weren't in any bands at the time. He said, "You guys, I have an idea." Let's start one of these thrash metal bands, speed metal bands. Uh, what do you think? And we, we were all in, of course. Yeah. We, we were all excited. And Doug, it was it was me and Doug. And we started listening and we started going to shows. We, we started, I had to educate myself on, on, on speed metal and thrash. Uh, at the time, uh, my, 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 my musical heritage was a 4-4 timing uh it was a, a flatted filth basically blues I, I was in a blues rock uh which doug was too we, we which 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 held us together in a musical way yeah. that gave us uh, some variety and and because we weren't going to forsake our blues roots but we were we were taking in the speed metal we were taking in uh the, the, the thrash metal aspects of it we, we were trying we were trying to find what made it tick we wanted our version of it, and uh, and so it was education mode. It was time to find musicians, and eventually we got Larry, we got we got Glenn, and, and that's a make a long story short. Everybody came together, and Roger Martinez was the vocalist, uh, the guy that I'd met a long time before before Sanctuary, and uh, his prediction to have a successful thrash band actually kind of was in came into existence, and uh, so that surprised me. Um, and uh, so that's where Vengeance Rising, that's where Vengeance, nobody called us Vengeance Rising back in the day. Right, yeah, because that's it. No, we, that was just a formality to keep us separated from a band from Holland called Vengeance. Okay, no, yeah. Yeah, and I'll say, and I'll say Vengeance problem. Rising now because there's been so much press. Uh, uh, the media, they presented us as Vengeance Rising. Our fans knew us as Vengeance. And so I call it Vengeance Rising because there's been so many articles, secular articles written about uh this speed metal band thrash band uh and so i always say vengeance rising at this point uh so the secular world will know where i'm coming from mm -hmm. and that's how that's how vengeance started bob okay well and and with vengeance i mean you guys got notoriety from the christian scene and the secular scene i mean the, you, people start taking notice of you pretty quick yeah they did because we were we were actually a very, very, very talented band. We had Larry Farkas, which he's just a total rock star. Um, and he is so musically talented. Uh, Larry was in a couple of different bands before he joined us. He was in Holy Soldier. Uh, okay. Larry was the glam rocker. But first time I saw him play, he was a glam rocker back in the Holy Soldier days. And then uh, he joined up with uh, Jimmy Brown of Deliverance. D yep. Deliverance, were they were kind of, they were moving in that thrash area. But they were still wearing spandex pants and, and uh, yeah, whoa, 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 doing those kind of folks. Oh, stuff. yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and Larry was a little bit ahead of them. And, and Doug told me, he said, Roger, Larry's really getting in this, this uh, speed metal stuff. And uh, let's go watch him play. And then we saw him play with the Deliverance. Uh, yeah, it was Deliverance. We saw him play with the Deliverance in Hollywood. And 
uh, after that, uh, we got a hold of, of Larry and we told him our vision and he was on board. Uh, he got on board. We needed a drummer. Glenn Man Crusoe, uh, he, he, was, he, he, he was on the worship team. And he saw us trying to find people together. He said, look, you guys, oh, and he's a great drummer. Glenn, fantastic drummer. And he said, all right, you guys, I'll play drums for you until you find a permanent replacement. We said, that's fantastic. Yeah. And so we got, we got Glenn, and Glenn was, uh, Glenn had, to, he had to learn things too. Uh, Glenn was a, a John Bonham top drummer, a Led Zeppelin. He, uh, he yeah. and, and, and Glenn was complete Hollywood. Also, when I say Hollywood, he had the uh, he had the Hollywood look. He knew a whole lot of Hollywood, uh, actually, uh, big big time musicians, and so he gave us that Hollywood feel. And he learned right along with us, and he gave a hundred percent. And we went through uh, several singers. Actually, we went through a whole bunch of people, Bob, before I actually dug it. I felt okay. This was the band. All we needed was the vocals, uh, and. Uh, Bob suggested Roger Martinez, and uh, and I said I think it'd be fantastic. Let's give him a call. He showed up on the scene, and after fifteen seconds of rehearsal, we knew he was the guy. He was the man. And it was it was perfect, and uh, it, it was it, he he was. We were full of diversity. Was one of our things that that was that made us popular. We yeah. we subconsciously people look at everybody on stage, and they're looking for somebody to identify with. Uh, for, for myself, I was the hick from the sticks, um, uh, southern uh, southern uh, hippie, you might say. Uh, Doug, he he, he was uh, Doug was a babe magnet, you know. He, he had movie star good looks, but he was very good at business. He was very business minded. When we okay. come to vengeance, everybody's got to have their role for a successful band. Glenn gave us Hollywood, and Larry was just a total rock star. He uh, athlete. His brother actually played uh, either professional or. or major minor league baseball is very good so uh larry brought the uh surfer um uh, attitude and, and of course martinez he, he he was complete it was complete valley girl with, with his language he was um he was in the uh, intellectual talk even though he was a surfer cat yeah uh, and his lingo uh, he talked about propitiation justification and, and these big words uh, <laughs> uh, but he was perfect uh, that separated us from the pack yeah uh, Right off the bat, we were the first thrash band, and uh, we were pretty dang good. We so, uh, um, take us and, and I'll say that uh, because God empowered us to be good. Oh we, yeah, we we we, did, we were on the edge as far as the way we dressed. We were sick of, of of holes in the pants. We did that in the very beginning. We were sick of the layered shag sprayed haircuts. We were sick of the the makeup on our face, uh, all that stuff. We were sick of it. And and, I, and it was time for a change. Uh, even though everybody else was comfortable, we kind of were, were in the forefront of that. And, and with Martinez and his vocals, it it was it was it was perfect timing for vengeance. Uh, that it was God's perfect timing, Bob, because uh, the the thrash metal crowd was open. Their brains were open to the gospel. Yeah, we, we had a good band. We were all young. Uh, and we were at the point in our musical careers where we're given 110 percent. We've all been in bands before. We all wanted to succeed as professional musicians. Plus, we wanted to get the gospel out. That was our main thing. Yeah. It really was, Bob. And that was our secret to success. And you all could. And then Roger really could bring a word. Uh, Roger Martinez. Yeah. Oh, he, he knew the word. He, in fact, uh, uh, he was he was doing. I believe there was a sanctuary Hollywood at the time, and he was pastor up there. And so, a lot of our songs came from his uh, uh, sermon notes. Basically, came from his sermon. And so, okay. that was another thing that we did different than other Christian bands. We put pure scripture in in our lyrics. Um, uh, you know, at the time, and I'm not knocking anybody, but a, a lot of the bands would go, "Jesus loves you." Yeah. <laughs> and that was the lyrics. Yeah. But, uh, our lyrics were, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son so that whosoever trusts in and relies on and clings to Jesus, so not perish, will have everlasting life. Yeah. Now, that, that's the word of God, and that holds weight. Okay. You I can read Jesus so loves important. me all day long. But see, so we important. put that. I think that was so important in the uh, in a lot of your 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 albums 
And uh, that's how you, you knew Sanctuary was just uh, set apart because it'd be the lyrics broken down with scripture. And it was just a solid thing because that was new stuff. You know, I was so 90 in 86 or so I was, uh, you know, I was born in 74. And so as a youth group kid during that time, it was like our opportunity to show our parents like, yeah, this stuff's heavy, but look at the lyrics, you know, this is solid stuff. And you, you, we appreciated that so much about vengeance. Well, a, a lot of, it was perfect timing too, because if it would have happened four or five years earlier, that would have been very, uh, we would have no acceptance from the Christian community. Uh, we, we were on the edge. And at the time, young people, uh, their parents looked at the albums yeah, and, and they said, okay, I, I'm going to make sure this is okay. or Christian. And there were some parents who would actually, they would they'd look at it. Thing. Most parents would look at us and listen. They, they, they go, no, there ain't no way. But there were some parents who would look at the album, look at the lyric sheets and go, okay, this, this is, this is beyond my scope. I mean, <laughs> that uh, was my parents. Uh, yeah. But they read the lyrics and they're going, this is, this is biblically sound. In fact, this is a good doctrine here. And they allowed a lot. Of, and so they allowed uh, uh, their teenagers to have this. And then that's where the ministry really, uh, it was, it, it happened with people with cassette tapes. It happened yeah. with young people with cassette tapes in high school said, check this out, giving it to their friends who were non-Christian. That's where the rear ministry was. Uh, there were so many, when it came to vengeance, it wasn't about us five. It was about us 5,000 or us 50,000, however many metalheads there were that had vengeance music and had the word of God and they could distribute it. Uh, we gave 100% in concert. We, we, uh, uh, and so I, I have to give everybody credit. Uh, and Sanctuary yeah. itself, Sanctuary behind us, it was a, it was a unified effort to present the gospel to some minds that were open. Yeah. Well, and the, uh, not too many people know this, but your first, Vengeance was so close, far out on the edge, that your first show, tell us, tell you, tell the audience, how did Sanctuary, how did Pastor Bob receive your first show? Well, the first show was actually encouraged by Pastor Bob. We had five songs. We just finished the five song demo type. Yeah, and uh, so we had five songs, and Bob called us in the office, and then we, we had Martinez. Everybody, we had the band together, and he said, "Aren't you guys to start to do gigs?" I said, "Time," and we're like, "Bob, <laughs> we've only got five songs." He says, "It doesn't matter. Play the five songs." And I said, "Okay," and uh, and I'm telling you, we we uh, we got a gig at we, we got a gig. There was there was a uh, there, there was a Christian metal gig. At, St. At, at a place called uh, the Waters Club, which is a, a very famous metal club uh, in, in South LA. And we were put in the last slot. Now, if you were a headliner, I can't remember who was headlining. It might have been Neon Cross or something. You generally played like fifth. You didn't play six, the last one. Yeah. So we were put in last place and we were okay. We got five songs. We're going to play those songs. And uh, now there was a Bob, there was a lot of the word was out about vengeance because they knew about Larry. Larry's a rock star. Everybody knew Larry. They knew Doug. He was a babe maggot. All the girls knew Doug. They knew Martinez. They knew Glenn. They knew Roger Dale from some uh, previous bands. And <clears throat> so the interest was there. It was a pretty good crowd. Um, time for us to go on. And bam, we hit it hard. We opened up hard. Uh, and we did our thing. And after the fifth song, we ended, we, we basically ended with beheaded with Martinez doing the streams. And you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. It was solid. There was no applause. There wasn't nothing. You could hear a pin drop. Hmm. And we walked off stage. And then, uh, the crowd kind of started talking again. I, 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 we were backstage and I heard, okay, well, they're, they're talking again. They didn't know how to take it. Uh, we, they didn't know how to take the vocals. Um, 
In fact, the very next day, Pastor Bob called us into his office. <laughs> <laughs> into the principal's office. <laughs> yeah. And said, all right, you guys, get your butts in the office. And so we all showed up. And, said, uh, and, and he was like, I don't know, you guys. You know, I, I'm not, I'm not, I, I think we might have gone too far with this. <laughs> but that was his first words. But really what he was doing, he was checking our hearts. Yeah. Because we, uh, now for me personally, I thought we got a great response. We kicked their butts. We, we, they didn't know how to respond. They didn't know. Uh, it was just like a lot of it was Martina's vocals because uh, it just sounded like the exorcist. I don't. I really don't know how the devil sounds when he speaks. It's probably pretty. But because of the exorcist and all these movies, oh, yeah. it sounded like Martina's. And Martina's, he nailed it. Oh, my gosh. And, and uh, none of Sanctuary heard all that. It was, it was all melodic. And it scared them. Uh, they didn't. They thought, "Oh no, we, we, we're doing something wrong here. We're, we're going beyond what we should." Pastor Bob and our hearts were right. And then at, at, at the end of the meeting, it says, "Okay, everybody, put it right here." You know, like how they do. One, two, three, let's go. And and, uh, and then that was in twenty four hours. Twenty four hours later, Sanctuary had embraced us. Uh, they had to have, basically had to have Bob's leading and say, okay, you guys, look, um, we're going forward with this. And, yeah. and uh, we, we want to, and, and my gosh, the next, the very next show, it was packed. We had more roadies. We had to turn away people. Oh, wow. And uh, I can't remember what club we played, but they couldn't even get everybody in. This uh, was a gospel movement. It was more than vengeance. It, it was it was um, it was a move of the spirit. Oh yeah. Oh oh yeah. yeah. Without a shadow of a doubt. Because uh, why would everybody embrace us that quickly? Uh, we took off. Bob, we took off. We were in the right place at the right time. Um, it, it was not seen not too long after that. We were playing a show down in Orange County, and uh, and there was some guys from San Francisco came down. They had an underground magazine. It was called White Throne, and they 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 had heard about our group, and they they had drove all the way down from San Francisco, which is a long drive, uh, to where we were playing. Oh yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. It was a place called Set Free Ministry, uh, was the name of it, and, and uh, there was in Orange County, lots of punks there. Uh, and so we played the show and those guys were there, blew them away. They did this huge article on us and, uh, we had a, uh, we had our cassette tape. We had our demo tape available for sale. And with that one underground magazine article, bam, we took off. That uh, was it. Uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, heaven's metal magazine, gospel metal magazine, all these un underground magazines, boom, that's, that's how we got our popularity. Um, was underground, the underground scene. Okay. I guess you might say it was the internet at the time um, on how you could get information. And then uh, we would, uh, people would actually mail in money for, and we'd mail out these cassette tapes. Huh. And before, before we had a record deal, we were doing ministry. People were handing out our, our, uh, our cassette tapes. Uh, and we handed them out too. And in fact, when we were, we were still going to these metal concerts, I don't know how many of these we gave away. We gave we just go out crowd and, and give give tapes away. Okay. Uh, so that's 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 how we got started. Uh, we started ministering way before we got a way before we had a we had a record deal, you might say. Yeah. Um, and so that's how Vengeance got started, and, and we didn't. It was kind of like the if the the the, the, the attendance at sanctuary it never went backwards it always went forward it it, it, it always was full steam ahead and the same way with 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 vengeance we, we went full uh it was almost a linear scale uh you know how a graph oh, yeah. does this? Yeah. we did not just we went up. straight up just like i mean took off like a rocket which rarely happens um and i think god got us where he wanted us and then we cruised for a while and I felt when it was time to split, I did. You just felt the peace about it. But it was it was a very it was fantastic ministry, 
and, and that's that was the beginnings of, of, of vengeance. And I, and I have to give all the credit to Pastor Bob for the vision. Uh, well, actually, God Himself. You know, of course, He get all visions come from Him, yeah. and uh, and and it was a fantastic time, perfect time. That that's the beginnings of sanctuary. That's the beginning of vengeance rising. Okay. Um, so at, at that that's where we're at, at this point. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> in you know, the story, then, there there came a part part where a point, like you said, when you felt time to go, um, and but you had two albums under your belt, and then uh, Vengeance Rising put out. How many, a couple more albums was it? Bob, ask me that again, please. So uh, there was a time that when you left Vengeance, they, yes. they ended up putting out a couple more albums, and then that was pretty much the end of it for Vengeance, correct? Oh, uh, well, well, yeah. For me, it was after the second tour. Yeah. We, uh, it, it wasn't working out financially. It wasn't working out... Um, in a few areas, it, it wasn't working. I felt like after the second album and the second tour, for me personally, uh, my time, Roger Del Martin, my time at Vengeance was gone. And, yeah. and so I went, I, I came back home. Actually, I, our last gig on the second tour was in Austin, Texas. As soon as I got off that stage, I went to the airport. I took, I, I, I took, I took a plane and I flew back to LA. I, I, that, was, that was it. I was done. Uh, okay. and, and I was going to tell the guys, and, and so they could get a replacement as soon, as soon as everybody got back. And uh, once I started talking to these guys, uh, well, they felt the same way. Everybody felt the same way about it. Um, we uh, we were real good with our money, but we had a lot of breach of contracts. Um, at the time, we, we had we played everywhere that we could, and people would would rip us off. Uh, okay. You'd have unprofessionals that were scheduling these gigs, they didn't know, they didn't know, they didn't know how to do it. And, and they were ministry minded and they were professionally, they, they weren't professional at all. Okay. And they had no bad, they had money to back them up. A lot of, most of these guys would say, well, we were waiting on ticket sales and we thought, you know, uh, you know, 10,000 people would show up because, because, because we had an album <laughs> and uh, <laughs> they, they, they wouldn't pay us. Because they didn't yeah, have, they happen. just didn't have the money, um, and, and that happened so much. Uh, that happened so much, and then we 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 uh, got behind. We uh, we had to borrow money for for t-shirts for our merchandise, and we had it we had it lined out everything on paper and percentages, but we just got ripped off, and and so that didn't work for us. Uh, we owed some money when we got back, so our plan. And once I talked to everybody, they said, okay, let's do a big concert here in Los Angeles. And, and believe me, we could sell every dang thing we had. When we had a big show, oh gosh, we'd sell, we'd sell so much. We, we, we'd do so well. And that's what we're going to do. It was no, it was no big deal. We were going to throw a big concert. We yeah. were going to headline, sell everything, come out in the black and then call it good. And, uh, well, Martinez, he, he was off. He was he was producing an album in in Australia or something I can't remember but he was out of the country when he came back he didn't agree with us uh, he said you guys no I don't Ben just needs to go on um, and they said no it doesn't it's done he said yes it is if we're going to go forward uh, and he said I'll, I'll get new people I'm going by myself and uh, we said okay if you want to go by yourself well, then uh, you uh, go for it, but but you got to pay for all this merchandise, all this this uh, this debt you might say from these T-shirts and all this merchandise. You're going to take it on yourself. Yeah. And we still had a couple of albums left on our uh, contract with the record company, and uh, and he said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, sounds good. Oh, I love this." And he was happy as uh, he's happy as could be. I was happy. I mean, we didn't have to do another concert to get rid of the merchandise. Yeah, okay. you got a way out. Yeah, and uh, because of the way things are in our popularity, we got a hold of Doug Van Pelt. He's the editor of Heaven's Metal Magazine, and we we told him, and he said, "I got to do an article right now. Our next, our next, our next issue is going to be on Vengeance Rising." And so he interviewed each one of us about this breakup of Vengeance. We all had our say. Everybody was happy, very happy. Interviewed Roger Martinez. He was very happy, happy camper all the way around. it was wonderful. Well, it didn't work out. Uh, later on, everybody knows the story. Yeah. Uh, 
but but I, I felt I was correct that that business was done. Now there may have been some ministry uh, uh, when he was fronting his own band. That I mean I don't know. All I know is that uh, uh, my time with Vengeance was very productive. I'm very proud of every show we did and everything we did. Sure. I'm proud of everybody who was in that group. I'm proud of Roger Martinez because he was the guy, man for the job at the time. Me personally, two albums, Vengeance did his thing, and it should have been done. That's my yeah. opinion. That's only my opinion. Well, and uh, I think everybody felt that same way except Martinez. He took it, and and the rest is history. Yeah, and, you know, those that are watching this thinking that we're going to dive in on the whole Martinez thing, we won't. Um, of course, we, we keep our brother in prayer, you know, and that uh, God would work on him somehow. But um, when Roger took that and everything, somewhere along the way then, um, there came, you were part of the group called Die Happy. Um, how did how did that all come out of the uh, of what uh, happened after Vengeance? Okay, well... Die Happy was a lot different than people thought. People thought that we just got rid of Martinez and and, uh, and we started another band. We called yeah, it Die of, Happy. A lot of people that, that, that's, 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 that's so far from the truth. That's 180 degrees from the truth. Yeah. Actually, uh, I started uh, I started playing uh, I started playing in a band called Triple H Band, and and we were a biker band. I've already I already moved on from Vengeance. I got a call from Doug, and, and we were I was playing prisons. I was playing biker shows, so I, I had a new gig. Uh, we were Christian bands, uh, and actually, I was put in the front man position where I'm doing the talking. Uh, and uh, so I, I, I didn't even think, I thought I'd never record those guys again. But Doug called me. He said, hey, Doug's the businessman, remember? Yeah. Uh, he said, Roger, uh, I called I called our old record company, and uh, I worked out a record deal with them. It's just me. I signed a record deal, just myself. And I'm putting together an album. Would you like to play bass on it? And I said, yes, I would. Thank you very much. And um, at the time, Bob, we we weren't rookies when it comes to record companies, okay? We, we knew about record companies, and we knew that this one record company would pay for a producer, uh, quite a bit for a producer. So Doug says, Roger, let's make some money. I said, let's do it. So <laughs> we hired ourselves as producers. There you go. Okay. We got the cash flow to actually make this album die happy. And oh my gosh, I, I would probably say that's the best money I've ever made as a musician. As far as the time I put into it, uh, it was the best. It was, uh, it was fun. It was, it was creative. It was wonderful. Uh, uh, I loved everything about it. And when the recording was done, uh, I left the group. Okay. I, I never, I, I didn't even play one. I played, you know, I didn't play any more shows, but my went to play, I went back to uh, uh, I went back to the Triple A band. Okay, uh, and so that that was just something that was Doug's gig. Okay, and see, he he called Larry and, and he said and and he told me, hey, Larry wants to play too. I said, well, that freaks me out. And then he called he called Glenn, and so and, they, and everybody wanted to do it, and that surprised me. It's kind of surprised everybody. And they put together Die Happy. Now I left because. I, I didn't feel like I was supposed to be a die happy. I was supposed to play on that album and I was supposed to get that cash. <laughs> but, uh. <laughs> but, um, my time with that was done. They, they got enough. They got a real professional, uh, super guy. And uh, Greg chase he, he played bass for them and they did some more shows and stuff. And, and they were fantastic. They, they went on to do another album and everything like that, but that was die happy. It had nothing to do with us getting rid of Martinez and starting our own band. Not yeah. even close. Uh, well, that's good. I, I, it was a it was a good band. It was one of those that was there, and it was delightful for us that uh, loved the the that scene. Um, so fast forward all these years now, you're um, you're back. You're doing a podcast with Sanctuary. You're doing uh, Grit and Gristle, um, and you're you've been doing some live ones when the when the COVID stuff hit, and people are seeing a lot more of Roger Dale, which is very cool, by the way. Well, thank you. Um, you know, Pastor Bob has asked me to do the Quit and Gristle, which is because a lot of people, uh, we were locked for, for, for a little while, we were locked down. Uh, it was kind of like really afraid to get out and we're, we're asked to not get out. Right. And a lot of people gained a lot of weight because there was nothing to do but eat or, or you know, 
uh, and and so Pastor Bob said, Roger, let's do a grit and gristle, kind of knock some fat off everybody. Uh, and I said, okay, sounds good to me, uh, because other than that, I, I've been doing uh, some kind of musical thing. Here's here's how to play Vengeance songs, and I was been doing a musical bass and bass guitar instructional stuff. Right. Yeah. And, and then also he asked me to do a family chat, which was encouraging others who were in lockdown too. And so uh, sanctuary. You know, they, they kind of got me going with the podcast and stuff. I'm still doing the grit and gristle. Uh, I'm still doing that. I, I kind of slowed down on the music thing um, uh, because I had big plans last year, Bob. You probably, you heard, I don't know if, you, yeah, I had big plans musically, but they didn't work out. COVID-19 kind of messed everything up. Well, In fact, not just for me, but yeah, everybody. You know, one of the things that I think, people that are following Sanctuary and Vengeance saw was that there was word out there. And I think they were even going to perhaps perform or something that audio feed that there was going to be a, a, a new form of vengeance coming. And maybe that's what you were alluding to that, but COVID uh, knocked everything out. Well, let me, let me explain that one. Uh, let me explain that one, Bob. <clears throat> Uh, I, I've been in a position to tour for the last couple of years, and uh, which is very, uh, and I haven't been. A after Vengeance, I never really was in a position where I could tour, and I knew I could tour. And then I started looking at, at, at several different um, bands and stuff. I, I thought maybe Once Dead might be able to do some things, uh, and that didn't work out. And, and I thought that Emerald would be uh, a band that I could do some things with, and, and they, they had some German connections. Uh, <clears throat> And I, I was talking to Pastor Bob this whole time, and he said, and then finally he said, Roger, I need to get, I need to, I need to hook up with you. And so I met with Pastor Bob, and he gave me a vision. He said, Roger, there's in Europe, and Pastor Bob has established several Christian concerts in Europe. In fact, oh, yeah, big ones. Very. In fact, he said, Roger, I, I've been a fan. There's 21, 21 Christian music festivals in Europe, and he said, Father and Son all like metal. And here, the vision I have for, for you, Roger, okay, if you want to accept, is uh, let's get a brand new vengeance. Uh, you're going to be the old man of the group. You get a bunch of these hot shot players here in Nashville. Uh, you create vengeance again. I'll put you on tour. We'll do, you'll do these 21 dates, and you'll be the front man. You'll be the mouthpiece. You will speak the word of God on the stage, and we're, yeah. we're going to do it one more time with vengeance. And... Uh, I thought, well, then obviously that's got to be it. And the first thing I did was call Doug and Larry, and I and I told them what was going on, and uh, they said, "Okay, we're not going to stop you, Roger. Um, uh, you've got our blessings. Take off." Oh, and, and once I heard that, I started. Uh, that's when I started looking at the metal scene here in in, in Nashville, uh, which uh, at, at the time before COVID hit, metal was big. There was lots of metal bands. In fact, Nashville was the biggest metal scene in the united states of course not in the world but it was the capital uh, i don't know where things are going to go from here but a lot of young players i mean my gosh i started going to these gigs and there were some standouts um i had a vocalist that was so good okay and i'm getting these players together and i'm going through a bunch of people uh, i'm doing auditions and none of these guys could pull it off when it came to larry's leads uh i was not happy i was not happy and then I went to a big show uh, here, and, and I got some connections where some guys who could probably pull it off. Uh, <clears throat> but then COVID hit, and nobody wanted to rehearse. And during that time, I decided against it. Uh, I, I'd been through a lot of a, a lot of people, and nobody could duplicate. But nobody could duplicate Larry Sparkus, and, and I had to have that. Uh, yeah, I I couldn't go on stage with something less than what it was. And then I made up my mind and, and I actually did a, I, I did a, a social media post and I said, can't do it folks. Uh, I, I can't, I can't take anybody else. I can't call anything Vengeance Rosen. Uh, I, I was going to before when I figured I could get the people who could do it. And, and I figured God was in this and, um, and, and we're going to do it one more time. Yeah. Uh, and it was a ministry purpose. And a lot of people didn't like it. In fact, nobody liked the idea except me and Bob. Okay. <laughs> you know, 
that that that's really the truth. But I, um, I've had opposition before, and I, I was ready for it again. Uh, but um, COVID hit, everything shut down, and so I, I'm not even thinking about it anymore. In fact, there will there will there will not be another Vengeance Rising. There will not be a, a, a new Vengeance Rising. Okay. Uh, at all. Uh, well, so, so that's not going to happen. And it, it won't come from me. If somebody calls themselves Vengeance Rising, it won't come from me. Yeah. Well, fair enough. You know, I, I think people that followed you all, all those years can absolutely respect that. And uh, so if people want to know what you're up to these days, they can uh, right on the screen, it says rogerdalemartin.com. Right. Um, and people can get in touch with, with you. I mean, you're a personal trainer now, but you do music uh, and stuff living in Nashville. Um, is that, that's probably the best way for people to get a hold of you, I would assume. Yeah, rogerdelmartin.com. You could, you could ask me stuff. Um, uh, Bob, my spiritual gift is encouragement or mm. um, <clears throat> exhortation, what some people call it, but it's basically encouraging. That's, that's why I love personal trainer. I don't, I, I'm, I've been a personal trainer. I don't have a whip. I've got pom-poms. Go, you can do this thing. Go, go, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, and right now, more than music, uh, uh, I, I'm being an encouragement to the body of Christ. So, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm into writing. I, I'm into writing. Um, and I, I was, I was working on a book. And, and in fact, I've got a book together, but I'm not ready to, I'm not ready to finish it because I, I, I'm, because a book's not going to sell unless you're touring, unless you're working it. You're not going to sell a book. Yeah. And I, I have to, so right now I'm, I'm really into blogs. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing blogs. I'm writing. Basically that that's my focus right now. I'm, I'm doing blogs. Uh, I'm, 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 I've got my website, rogerdelmartin.com. And, and that's really what I'm going to go in for. And, and with my blogs, I want to be an encourager. I want to use my spiritual gift. I, I, I basically, I want to encourage the body of Christ. Uh, right now I'm doing this series called Sanctuary Hall of Fame. And, I've really been enjoying those. Okay. Well, well, thank you. And, and basically, if you read those, it's an encouragement to the body of Christ. I, I want to encourage these guys who are out there still on the front lines uh, 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 preaching the gospel. And that, that's what I want to do. I want to encourage Christians. Uh, and so right now, it's it's more about writing. Uh, Grit and Gristle, I'm doing that. Uh, there, I'm doing that. I don't know where that's going to go. And I'm always open musically. I keep my chops up. Um, right now, I haven't been doing many music videos just because I'm really focusing on writing. Uh, yeah. But that's where I'm at, uh, writing blogs. I'm a blogger. Uh, I guess you could say I'm a video podcaster. And uh, I still do a little bit of personal training. Not much. That's, uh, I'm semi-retired. That's why, I, Bob, I said I could go on tour right now. Oh, yeah. Okay, because I don't have to have a nine-to-five job to survive. Yeah. And so, and, and believe me, that, that's unusual. It's unusual for Roger Dale. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and so that's why I was so fired up to get out there. Uh, but uh, I'm very excited about what I'm doing right now. I'm excited about uh, Sanctuary. I'm excited, Bob, I'm excited about this, this, whatever we're doing right here. Oh, yeah. What, what, is, what is this called? What do you call this program? The Origins of Christian Rock. Oh, the origins of Christian rock. Well, fantastic. <laughs> well, we've been on the right sub subject. We, we're right on. <laughs> so, well, that's awesome. Well, I, I, I really appreciate your time. Uh, and uh, people that are uh, tuned in to YouTube or Facebook on Sanctuary, they're going to see you pop up um, with your grit and gristle and this and other things. And so, um, again, if anybody watching wants to get in touch with Roger Dale, just go ahead and visit his website. It's right there on the screen. And uh, uh, Roger, we thank you for taking your time to chat with us and bringing us up on the history and all that went into um, vengeance and who you are as a person. So thank you. Well, you're welcome, Bob. And it's been a pleasure to be on your show. It's fantastic. I love doing this stuff. All right. <laughs> you have a good one. Yes. Peace, love, and metal!